The Left Wing Podcast in association with Land Rover. Whether you're headed to a match or a weekend away, there's plenty of space for your team and their gear in the new Discovery Sport. And they were O'Driscoll, Morgan, extra man, it's Fitzgerald. Oh, Fitzgerald is coming back inside! Let's have another! Darcy O'Driscoll oh. through the legs, Rob Carney, out to Fitzgerald again, step and score! Hello and welcome to the Left Wing Independent.ie's rugby podcast in association with Land Rover. I'm Will Slattery, delighted to be joined in studio as always by Luke Fitzgerald. Luke, hello. Will, how are we? Good, still alive. The coronavirus hasn't claimed me yet, as yet. We're as in big masks. Yeah, yeah we're in hazmat suits. suits yeah. Well, you were always, you know, using a lot of hand sanitizer before with mainstream and cool. You know, you used to I like to shake, shake your hand, Will. You used to give me <laughs> fist bumps and stuff. I didn't like the look of you, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, you got to be careful out there. Be careful out there. Yeah, yeah germaphobe. Yeah. I'd be joined in the studio by Keen Tracy as well. Keen, hello. Thanks for coming in. Coronavirus free, I hope. Yeah, I hope. As well. I was yeah. in Italy you a few were, weeks ago. I was going to say, that's a big claim. You were a Treviso Lance for a few weeks. Weeks ago, yeah, and then it, it kind of kicked off from there. As far as I know, I'm probably joining the dots a bit too much, but as far as I, yeah, I haven't my... put myself in self isolation, or maybe I haven't. I've taken myself out just for this yeah, podcast. We'll, we'll for... try you and Michael Lovely and... in this nice little tight room. I feel so <laughs> <Yeah>. safe now. <laughs> How uh, reassuring. Yeah. So we were talking upstairs, Keen, about what we might talk about in this podcast because everything rugby wise is very much up in the air. A little later on, we're actually going to hear from Brian Byrne, former Leinster hooker, who's recently, very recently, gone over to uh, to Bristol Bears. So get an insight into his move and how he's getting on over there but for the moment if we're talking about rugby current affairs Keane you have some breaking news hot off the presses Ireland versus France conceivably in the balance once again yeah ran down from the third floor down to make sure I got it <laughs> brought it to you guys fresh hot yeah. off the press um, yeah basically the the French Union are meeting with the French government tomorrow which is Wednesday so maybe some people will have already heard it by then um to me, it sounds very like the meeting that the IRFU had with the Irish government last week. Mm. Um, you know, the Six Nations organisers organizers came out on Monday and said that, you know, all games are set to go ahead. But, like, it was a real wishy-washy statement because they ultimately don't make the call here. And there was the caveat of unless the government of course, basically yeah. said otherwise, so, which is what's happening. Maybe. Yeah, so I imagine a decision will probably be made either way tomorrow, which, you know, will be beneficial because the Ireland team are training away at the moment, you know, not knowing if they've got a game next weekend. So... I, my gut feeling is that it's going to be cancelled, but I guess we'll wait and see. Yeah, well, like we'll try to come with it from just a rugby perspective rather than just speculating about whether the games go ahead or not go ahead or, or what have you, because it's a very... That's a little rap on the knuckles for you there, isn't it? No, yeah. no, no, I mean... Speculating about whether the game's no, going I mean, ahead? No, I We wouldn't mean... dream of doing that in the left wing. <laughs> <laughs> but our guests, on the other hand... Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Bring the time I, have too, I have too much journalistic integrity to do that. No, I'm joking. Uh, but it's a really strange time for the Irish team. Mm. Like, you, you think they come off that hammering in Twickenham uh, then the Italian game gets cancelled. This one's up in the air, but they're yet they're training away. You know mm. they don't really have a release to get out of their system on the pitch in terms of you know what Andy Farrell might do with the squad. It's yeah. like they, they mightn't get another chance until the summer or November. Who knows? It's a really bizarre time. Yeah, look, it'll be really frustrating for them, you know. And they received a huge amount of criticism after the game, you know. And look, they'll be really disappointed. I'm sure the meeting after the game. Like those things can go one of two ways. They might try and show opportunities that they missed out on, but more than likely, I think after that one, they'll probably have been, you know, I'd say going through, particularly the defensive side of the game. Um, you know, it could be a good thing. You know, maybe just you know getting out of camp. Um, but they haven't got. They don't have any. Really yeah, out but of even camp. when they do, like I, yeah. I would suspect uh, not to speculate, but to build on what Keane was saying. Um, <laughs> that they, that yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, if that game is called off, I think it, it may be a good thing. Like I think um, it'll give everyone a bit of time to reassess what's going on because it doesn't seem like there's been a huge amount of progress. I would think uh, thus far. Now again, like I was thinking about this in in the meantime, he's only had three games. You know what I mean? Like, and he's kind of and now. I and I was fairly critical. I was fairly critical of a few aspects of it, um, and I think they do require some some introspection on those. Like, I think some some parts of the game plan. I think will be, be it'll be beneficial for them to have a bit of time away and really think about the problem that England caused them because that seems to be the it, it, that's the key thing in rugby at the moment. You look at South Africa in the final. You look at England in the World Cup in the games they played well. Like suffocating teams with that defensive pressure, figuring out a way around that, figuring out how you manage the game, um, and I think. Um, it does require some thought because it's the next big it's the big challenge because it doesn't look like they're refereeing the, the, the offside line to me so this is something that you're going to have to come up against all the time um, so I think it requires some deep thought and, and probably a change of tact in lots of different areas that maybe have been you, you might have just said well that's just how we play the game it's kind of you know ingrained in you 
Um, so I think it requires a reassessment of a few of those areas. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. You know, like I think, um, you know, there's probably pros and cons with, with maybe having a game or not having a game. Um, I'm sure the players will be frustrated they don't get another chance. Well, for the record, the reason I said not to speculate because if it gets cancelled tomorrow, then we I don't want to spend like 30 minutes speculating tonight if it gets cancelled tomorrow. I wasn't, you know, accusing Keane of, of reckless oh, speculation. Oh, disclaimer, you're in the hot yeah, seat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 I just didn't want to... Stand over what you're going to say, man. <laughs> I, just Jeez, have I don't some, uh, want people to feel like I'm attacking Keane, you know? Yeah, that's what it felt like over here. Know. But look, <laughs> it, it is interesting, Keane, because I think like, um, I, I'd be interested to get your take on things and maybe we've had a bit of time to digest that game over in Twickenham. What do you think about it? Um, have and had a little bit of time to maybe calm down about things and, and have a proper look at it. Like the biggest disappointment for me was that England didn't do anything that we didn't expect them to do. And yeah. if we didn't on the outside expect them to do, to do it, you can be sure that Ireland were expecting it mm. too. Um, I don't think it was any disgrace going to England, going to Twickenham and losing, but the scoreline didn't reflect the dominance yeah, that exactly. that England had. Um, I would be concerned <coughs> that. Ireland didn't have a way to counteract what England threw at them. Um, I heard you last week talking with with Frano, like just in terms of like using the kicking game. You saw how well England did it, you know. And when Elliot Daly was named at full back, it, it was just so obvious that they were going to do that. But still, Ireland weren't able to counteract it. So, yeah, I was I was very disappointed uh, coming away from there. I think it was one of those games where. Not sure if it came across on TV as much, but like England were just so much better than Ireland in every aspect in terms of the physicality. It reminded me of what they did in the Six Nations last year and then what they did in Twickenham in the summer as well. So I think, yeah, it's it's only three games in and I'm not at all like pressing the panic button, but I was a little bit concerned that, that there was no signs of that Ireland have kind of thought how to get around that. I think... The Italy game, if it had gone ahead this week, would have been ideal because even like us now, we're still talking about the England game. If we had a game to look forward to, you might be able to turn the page. And albeit a home game against Italy is not going to suddenly paper over the cracks at all. I just think it would have helped the players kind of get that out of their system. And it also would have given Andy Farr the chance. I think I think the likes of Caitlin Doris and Ronan Kelleher were shoeings probably to start. No matter what ha- happened in, in Twickenham. But I think now it becomes a question that if the France game does go ahead, is Farrell going to be brave enough to play these guys in Paris? Now, I think Caelan Doris is fair enough because he did start the first Six Nations game, but these are the kind of questions that Farrell is facing now at the moment. But I guess it's still, it's all up in the air. Like the, the squad came back in on Sunday as normal and, you know, went through the training week. So they trained Monday, they trained Tuesday, they'll have a break, they'll come back in and they'll train Thursday. The last, there's no media this week, which is, you know, Tough as well because you don't have a sense of what's actually going on, and you'd imagine it would be a tough training week without without having a game this weekend. And Andy Farrell and Johnny Sexton were up for media last Friday, and Andy Farrell was kind of hinting that they might get a team in to, to train with them. Now I'm trying to find out if that has been the case because they trained with the under twenties last week, which is beneficial in itself. But he was suggesting that it would be another team, so it'd be, it would be interesting to find out if they did get someone in, to, you know, to, to run plays against them. Um, what about what Luke was saying that like having no game might be beneficial in terms of you, betting in any new ideas that they might have been shelving momentarily because they had England and they didn't want to you know, try too much. It's hard to get the new idea. Like in a pressurised circuit, like tweaking away, there is like an English team in there, like when things are going well for them, when the crowd is on your back, like mm. it is difficult to implement new ideas. Like you do end up kind of reverting to what you're comfortable doing. And remember, they've been with a very, like a coach who's very disciplined and strict for the last, I mean, it was a four or five years. So, um, you know, that is difficult to kind of get out of those habits and get out of the things you have been comfortable doing for a while. So that's probably a good thing. That's probably, yeah. When you look at how beneficial it was to England and New Zealand at the World Cup, you know, it was massively helpful for them when they went into the, the quarterfinals. But I just think a home game against Italy would have been ideal to mm. kind of try those new things because yeah. it's all well and good doing it in training and I know Italy have been so poor again in, in this Six Nations I think that would have been the time where we might have seen a little bit more of what they're about and then suddenly you've got the confidence built back up going to Paris to try those things in what is a very different atmosphere Just you mentioned that Andy Farrell and Johnny Sexton for the media what did you make of Johnny Sexton's comments about the captaincy you know about you know turning your back to the York or to the crowd if you're yeah, directing it was a good, quote, was a good quote actually good yeah quote, but what did you yeah. make of that whole interaction um, Well first of all I think the, the whole thing about Johnny Sexton's captaincy has been blown massively out of proportion like we said, it's Andy Farrell's like third game in charge. It's only Sexton's uh, fourth because he had won at the World Cup against Russia. Um, like 
I, I don't know. I think Johnny Sexton had a really poor game against Twickenham by his own very high standards, and that's kind of, you know, made the problem even worse. But I don't see him as being a poor captain. I think he has done reasonably well chatting to the refs. I mean, two French officials, Tricky, Jakob Piper, was, was a bit of a test as well. So I think a lot of it's been blown out of proportion because he had a bad day at the office, but I don't necessarily think that that's down to his captaincy. Look, I thought he was right. He came out and he he fought his corner. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens because it was sort of made out that it wasn't a permanent thing that he's going to be captain. I think it'll be interesting to see if he's captain going on the Australian tour because that's a tour that you'd imagine we're going to see the likes of Will Connors play, like Ryan Baird, who was called back into the squad this week. I know he was a development player. Like I think that's the tour where you're going to start seeing these guys be blooded in more because Farrell would have a bit more time. And is Johnny Sexton still going to be captain for that tour? Uh, we'll wait and see. I think he's earned his chance to be captain in the Six Nations. And there's no point in sort of, you know, trying to t- throwing the toys out of the pram because one game didn't didn't go well. Um, it was interesting, you know, like, Ron O'Gara came out and said that he felt like he already had too much control in the team that he didn't need to be captain so I mean I'm not one to argue with Ron O'Gara if that's what he thinks but Johnny Sexton certainly wasn't too impressed with uh, with his comments either um, what did he say I don't know why he's commenting on us because he's the coach of La Rochelle but he's also a pundit so ah, look it was a bit of maybe much ado about nothing I, I'm, I still think that he's a good a good captain I would say, though, I was one of the ones in favour after the World Cup of James Ryan sort of taking her on now. And I sort of don't really want to go down that because the decision has been made. And I think Sexton, of what he's achieved in his career, has waited long enough. And I think he, he deserves his chance. And I wouldn't be panicking just because of one bad day in Twickenham. Yeah, I look, he looks injured to me. Simple as. Like, I think that's he keeps saying he's not. He was asked again on Friday, like, what's the story? And he said, no. No, I'm not so sure. Why would he say he, like he's not going to tell us anyway? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, like there's no value in telling yeah, anyone. Like the strapping on his knee is mm. like that looks really like medial ligament strapping. I've done a, I've done my medial ligament four or five times. It looks very similar to that, which would be a disaster to kick with. Um, but he's obviously not going to tell other other teams that you know. Like why would he do that? So, um, look, he may not, but it just looks like very heavy strapping on that side. So look, I would I would say he doesn't look like he's kicking like himself it looks like the that, that could be something that will be impacting that we've seen him kicking brilliantly for 10 years like you know what I mean it's not it's just that's I think that was causing the shock in terms of performances I think around the pitch very difficult to to really perform that well when the pack is going backwards it's just really really difficult now I don't think he helped himself um but he'd be the first to admit that as well it was a bad game I think you move on in terms of the captaincy um I'd say the Raj thing would have stung because they're they've become quite close um, and I think that's probably why you saw that kind of reaction um, around it um, because that would have been I think that would have hurt I think the other stuff you kind of say you kind of expected look I think he's the right guy at the right time I think Keane is right I think you know whether whether he gets to the next World Cup or not will dictate whether he keeps the captaincy you know and whether he's he's so far ahead at the moment currently in terms of the people that we have behind him now I think the gap sorry He's he's uh, he's far ahead because other people haven't been given real you know consecutive chances. I think Ross Burns has been playing some great rugby. I think Frawley looks like a real talent, um, you know, and obviously Joey Carver. We know he's a quality operator. I still I'm not going to harp on about where I think his best position is, but there is guys who are close. But I think there's still a clear difference at the moment, um, and based on that, I think given the experience, given he's usually very astute as to what's going on at the game and at, at that time, I think he's a really good captain. He's the respect of the team around him as well because of what he's achieved. So. To question the to question the captaincy at this point, I thought was wrong. Um, to question the performance, I think that's part and parcel of being the the, the main man. And Johnny would be would be I'm sure he's well aware of that. I thought that you saw that in his response. So look, I think it was a bit premature to be questioning both the guys. I do think we do need to see a, a bounce back. It's unfortunate that we may not see that now. So um, yeah, like I kind of like the reaction. I'm I'm kind of keen on it. Like normally, uh, normally I always think don't bother engaging, but. Um, it was nice to see that there's a bit of fire burning in there, and that he's still the lad's gonna bite. Yeah, yeah, he, he's a, he is a biter. In fairness, he is a biter. He looks like he looks like a biter. He sounds like a biter. He is a biter. No, but he, he look. The thing is. He, he, that won't hurt him you could see it was still hurting him I think mm. the Raj thing was always going to hurt because the fact, they're friends now and the fact he rattled off that great quote I mean he'd been he, thinking about it exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was a really really interesting quote and I'd never heard it before but and he wouldn't tell us actually who, who told him he said someone told me recently but um, yeah the fact he rattled that off you could tell it was playing on his mind but mm. yeah I, like, I thought he spoke very well after the, the in, in Twickenham itself and last Friday he came out fighting like he's not going to sit down and say oh yeah maybe I shouldn't be captain like he's what 30 
33, 34. Um, He's waited long enough for this and he's been around the block enough to... And he, like, he keeps saying that he's been doubted throughout his career and I have to say, I can't remember too many times when, when, he, has been, when he has been doubted. I, don't, I think players like sometimes... Have Some people need that, don't they? Ah, yeah. like, yeah. when, when, when he started, started off, there was a while. There was a while. He had the Rodge yeah. thing, but like yeah. he's been that Ireland's was like years. But he's been Ireland's like you know outstanding player for, for the while. last. Yeah, yeah. For, it's been you know. But wow. it's funny how that fire still burns yeah, yeah. in him. You know, like yeah. it, it is funny because like different people have different ways of I don't know just creating a little bit mm. of conflict that they really feel like they thrive Us against in. them kind of thing. It is. It's yeah. a real kind of siege mentality. Like I'm. I I have to admit, I did think the same thing. I was like. Uh, it's quite a while since he's got like a real stick about it and that people have been doubting him, you know. So, look, if you're going to have a bad performance, like because you're touching the ball so often and you're the kind of orchestrator, um, to, to coin his expression, um, you know, I think um, you're going to question constantly. It's whether or not you feel like that's justified or not. Like, I, that maybe that's what's playing on his mind. Mm -hmm. But you're, it's kind of inevitable when the team doesn't play well that you're the guy who's going to be in the firing line. He's the kind of guy who strikes me as if Ireland, like, don't win, he's not going to sleep well for the following week without the captaincy. And now that he has the captaincy, I feel like, you know, he takes that on double full. <laughs> like, he, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, because yeah. he really, it means so much to him. So, yeah, I, like, I, I was impressed with how he bounced back. But I guess the, the proof will be in the pudding when or if Ireland get to play another game. It'll be interesting, you know, you're mentioning the training schedule at the moment where it's very much business as usual with a view mm. to that France game. But as you said, with that meeting tomorrow, you know, what the contingency plan is then, what mm. did they do? Do they go back to their provinces? Do they just train as usual? Because for a lot of them, there's a set, for, especially for the, the Leinster contingent, like there's a two-match trip to South Africa mm. just before starts. And the, the big players aren't going to go on that because it's not ideal. They saw it up in they Munster. Might, they might be now, though. The more of them might be going just, if they don't just, get a game. But like, remember a few years ago, Munster had a two-week trip before they played Rasting and then they looked very heavy-legged mm. at the start of that game. They but were it, 20 points down. It's, at, it's not a deal, but like, I mean, they might need they might need minutes. If, if they're not going to play, obviously not this weekend, if the game yeah. France game gets cancelled like you might not see Johnny Sexton go but you're going to see you know lots be, of other it would be six too. weeks between the England game that's and the Leinster Saracens game crazy. Which, without rugby which yeah. would be crazy you yeah. couldn't have that that's way yeah. that's like nearly a pre-season yeah. kind of do you know what I mean it's, but yeah I don't know how they're going to go I'd love to know how they're approaching training this week because while it's scheduled as a normal week it's just not a normal week when you're obviously trying to, I would imagine, to up the intensity somehow because you need to try and make up for not having a game this weekend because they're not going to be in camp um, this weekend. So, yeah, I'd say there'll be a lot of kind of waiting around their phones tomorrow to see sort of what the what comes out of uh, this meeting, really. Because mm. it's it's an unprecedented situation. Put mouth, was there kind of a, was yeah. a similar? Yeah, but there was more wiggle room in the schedule, I guess. It's more with the rest of this season, like in terms of... As in, it's become more packed, like yeah, the schedule. Yeah, and that's, it's become okay. more packed. Like there, was, yeah. there was only like eight or nine rounds of Celtic League back then in the first okay, year, yeah. so you, you could slot in more matches. Whereas this, if the Six Nations games fall, there's no there's no obvious it's, place to put yeah. them in. The World Cup has is a major factor in that as well, because that's why Ireland are only playing two tests in Australia this summer, where they'd normally play play three. Um, that's down to the player welfare across the board, because you were kind of thinking, geez, maybe they could kind of fit it in around then. October seems like the most likely date, and that's kind. Of what we're hearing um, behind the scenes because if you were to talk about September that means players coming back earlier from pre-season which again is they're supposed to have a longer break after the World Cup so you're kind of trying to fit it in maybe before the Champions Cup games in October that's talking about the Italy game now who knows if it's going to be two um, but yeah the, the calendar is so congested at the moment that back in 2001 to foot them out it was it was a bit easier wasn't it? Yeah it's more oh, yeah, it's in, more so I was in school sure to you lads were as well <laughs> yeah. it's more so if club games start falling as well you know it's like what, yeah. what happens then you know yeah. because there's no they, they can't reschedule you know a mm. whole heap of club matches yeah, no, it's like it's it's so up in the air at the moment, and like there's no point in us pretending we we have the answers either because we we really don't. But you saw last week in Paris, the half marathon on Sunday was was cancelled because it seems like you know from what you read, the mass gatherings are the ones that the virus can spread quicker. So like, what's the capacity of Stade de France? Like eighty thousand yeah. people, you know. Um, I think what's a bit confusing is that the Six Nations, you know, that the Ireland-Italy game was postponed this weekend, but as it stands, um, England are going to Rome next weekend. And while any of the Italian fans who had booked tickets, I think they were talking around 2,000 fans were, were due to come over this weekend, there's nothing stopping them from coming over now. And while, okay, they won't be in that congested Aviva Stadium with 48, whatever, 50,000 people, there's still nothing stopping people from getting in and out of the country. So it's a very, very unprecedented situation like you said and yeah it's it's pretty 
it's pretty scary as well, like, isn't it? When you think about it, like now that it's actually hit Ireland, you're kind of it's a bit more on edge because I feel like we're such an insular country at times where oh, everything is so far away. And when you hear it's hit China, like, you know, it's so far away. But to see how fast it's spread, it's a, it was a real eye opener. And I guess that is the most important thing, the health at the end of the day. You know, yeah. if a rugby match doesn't go ahead, it's not, you know, the end of the world. But yeah. I, look, there is a big difference between 300 people coming over mm. on a plane versus 80,000 gathering in, in, in something. And you don't know how quickly this thing is transferring between. So I, I agree with you. I think it's a... It's a it's a disaster for all us like sports mad people, but I think at the end of the day, like if you had one more person that died because of something that you didn't, mm. uh, some kind of precautionary measure you didn't, uh, you know, take, I think that'd be a bit of a sickener, you know. Um, I don't know if that's the right way of wording that, but it would not <laughs> be a good. It would not be like you, you. I don't think you'd be able to forgive yourself if you if you had an opportunity to say, look, we can't watch a sport, we can't watch a, a game of sports, you know, and someone someone's family is is short. Yeah. Someone, you know, I think that's uh, it, it's an easy enough justification to make if you're the minister. Now, I do think they didn't do a great job of communicating that, mm. which is uh, was a bit disappointing because, like, you know, it's. It's a great weekend. Like it's such a big weekend for so many people traveling across, and and you know for all the pubs and the restaurants and all. So, um, you do you know you just hope that they communicate this one correctly and in a timely fashion with the with the relevant parties. You know. Yeah. Well, as Keane said, everything's still pretty much up in the air. But thanks so much for coming in and giving us the best insight. I guess we can get into what's happening at the moment. No Breaking news. <laughs> Speculative <laughs> news. <laughs> the works. <laughs> Well, I'm delighted to be joined on the line by a man who, up until very recently, was a member of the Leinster setup, but now is wearing a different coloured jersey. I'm sure it's odd to get your head around it. Brian Byrne on the line. Brian, thanks so much for joining us. No worries at all. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, delighted to have you on. And even last night, I know you pu- pulled on the Bristol jersey for the first time playing in the pre- Premiership Cup for them. Was it strange, you know, talking out in a new dressing room, new teammates, putting on new jerseys, a lot of new accents there as well? Uh, how did you find it? Don't, yeah, don't was, worry about their was, accents here. Don't worry about their <laughs> accents. I'd say, uh, did I understand you, man? <laughs> <laughs> They're struggling a bit, but uh, yeah, it was definitely different. Uh, it's the first time I've actually heard the Bristol accent. It's unbelievably strong. It's a, it's a good one to listen to. But um, no, it was, it was different. And I, I got, uh, I was in training on Friday, so just trying to learn the names and the moves uh, and line outs, et cetera, uh, as quick as possible. So um, it was good to get hit out there last night. And um, what was the process like to, to go on over there? Was it something that came up on really short notice and now all of a sudden you're, you're over there? Was it something you you talk, you taught about for a while? Like, how, how did it come about? Yeah, it actually happened uh, very quickly. So I was uh, in Leinster on a Friday, it's probably a couple of weeks ago now, and um Leo came up to me and he's like, listen, there's an opportunity in Bristol. Uh, Harry Tacker, their starting hooker's injured and Pat Lamb is interested in getting you over. What do you reckon? Uh, so I said, yes, like, um, I need I need the game time. And I knew I, I wasn't going to be in Leinster next year. So it was kind of a perfect transition um, for that, kind of even looking for a club for next year as well. So, um Put Leo told me about half nine Friday morning. Pat Lamb rang me ten minutes later and he said we'd love to have you. And I said yeah, perfect. So Joe, if you okay, did and I signed on the Wednesday, um, and then basically left a few days later. So it was very very quick. Yeah, is it strange then to have to kind of pack up and move kind of to a new country on, on such short notice, especially when you've been in Leinster for a while? Is it probably been four, I think four or five six years since you, since you made your debut there? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been, yeah, I've been Lancer nearly eight years. So three years in the academy, Jesus and then five Christ. years on this. Yeah, so <laughs> I know it's been. I a remember weird. the two of uh, you lads coming in, yourself and your brother coming in, and honestly, I was like, who are these these young lads, little tots? And I was like, Jesus, that's eight years ago. Oh my god, yeah, I mean, they were little yeah. tots to be fair. Well, they were little, but like, do you know what I mean? I was like, who are these young lads coming in? We'd heard a lot about you in, in Clongos and that eight years. Jesus, that's depressing. Yeah, I'm know. actually going to go quiet and let you answer the question now, and just go into the little hole there. Very depressing. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was. It was actually very strange because so I packed up my stuff on the Monday and um, all the lads were well gone out training and um, I was just like, geez, this is the last time I'll ever be in here. Like, um, so it happened unbelievably quick and I don't think I even processed it um, for what it was until I kind of got here and I was like, okay, yeah, uh, it's all happened so quick. But um, yeah, it was it was different. So I was leaving, packing up the stuff and saying goodbye. 
And um, just as well, Bernie, I mean, I, I suppose, like, you know, you said the decision was made fairly quickly and it was kind of a match made um, in heaven and that they were short someone and you obviously knew you were going to be without a club next year. Did you have, I presume you thought about the club and you thought, yeah, like, I, I, like, I like this. And like, if that was the case, what did you like about the place? Is it kind of the ambitious nature of it? Is it working with Pat Lamb? Like, what really stood out for you and made the decision so easy? Yeah, I've I've been watching Bristol a decent bit um, over the last couple of years, and like since they came up from the championship, they're playing like an unbelievable style of rugby um, that I think would suit me. Um, so that was very appealing. And Pat Lamb, I chatted to a few lads about him that had him in Connacht and stuff, and they all loved him and loved the system that he has. So uh, and then they're we're third in the table now, so like it's a very ambitious club. Some unbelievable players there, and then everyone else fits into the system really well. Um, so yeah, I really like the way the, the style of the play. And then Pat Lamb as a coach, um, he rang me, told me about the culture of the place, um, what they're aiming for, and uh, it was no brainer in the end. And in terms of next year, like, had you already engaged with other clubs? You're already looking around, or like, how? What, what was the situation when this call came in? Yeah, um, I've been chatting to a few different clubs. Um, I have not on, like put to paper yet. So, uh, like even Pat, Pat knew my situation. He said, "Listen, uh, eight of eight or next ten games are televised. Like if if you're going to stay here, if you, or if you're going to come another club, like it'll definitely put you in the shop window. Um, and you're playing kind of like the top Premiership games, so uh, it'd be a brilliant opportunity for you. So that was it, really." Yeah, and what's that process like, Brian, when you're kind of looking to, for your next move and you're in a club where, you know, when the competition is so fierce, you mightn't get that exposure? Is it a kind of a worrying time in a way when you don't know where you're going to be playing next year? Yeah, it is. I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't. Like, it's, uh, it is very stressful, to be honest. Um, especially, like, if you're not playing, then you're like, no one's actually seeing what I'm doing here. So, um yeah, it was. It, it is stressful and hopefully now it gets out in the next kind of couple of weeks. Um, but it definitely does play on your mind. And just when you don't know like if you're going to be in the country or what country you're going to be in. Um, and then, yeah, just trying to plan for next year. So, And one part of leaving that I guess must have been particularly tough is obviously, you know, as Luke said, you came in with your brother. You know, you, you guys are like linked, I guess, you know, being identical twins. Was it particularly tough then to, to, kind, of, to, to kind of break that bond? Yeah, it actually was. Um, yeah, he, we've we've been playing together for twenty years now. So um, when when this came about, it kind of it was one of the things I hadn't really processed yet. That I was like, "Geez, I, I might not ever play with him again," which is um, which is fairly bleak. But um, yeah, it's um, it was definitely a big factor. Like, I've, obviously, I think the longest we spent apart ever is probably 10 days so it's going to be a big change um, but yeah, it is a, like it's an unbelievable opportunity so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it and it's a really exciting time for you. I completely agree I mean look obviously there's the worry about you know and a little bit of uncertainty but I think these situations can bring out the best in you and I've always felt like you're definitely amongst those guys in Leinster who are probably just stuck or were stuck behind like internationals there are so many good guys that are in that situation like and it's just really tough you have to be really really patient with your opportunities but I mean I presume you're looking at this as like a really exciting time for you because it's all out in front of you you can see from like all the well wishes and all that from all the guys that you know how well thought of you are in the setup. So I mean, at least you know you have that there, and people will have seen that. So I mean, are you confident about getting into somewhere you like, and about I suppose like what I would see it as, you know, being able to perform to your potential? Because to this point, you haven't really had enough opportunity to really do that. Yeah, um, I am really excited. Um, even you know, new faces, uh, fresh eyes watching the game, different systems. So um, I am very excited to get into it and hopefully hopefully we'll be playing this weekend uh, find out tomorrow with Harlequins on Sunday so that would be an unbelievable one to get first cap for Bristol in um, but yeah as you said like it was unbelievably competitive in Lens so I absolutely loved it there um, it's such a such a great bunch of lads and like obviously top coaches um, and they're going very well at the minute so that, and that was tough to, to leave as well um, like on a 
on and on beating Ron and going very well. But um, is it easier to leave I, when I you're just, not in the team, Bernie? Is it like is it that does it make it a little bit easier? I know it's a great setup and all that, but does it make it a little bit easier when say you're not always you're not getting enough game time? Yeah, well, uh, if I was in the team, I don't think I'd be leaving. To be honest. <laughs> That's a fair point. It's <laughs> a fair point. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thanks yeah. for that, man. You make me look like a gobshite here. <laughs> More of a gobshite. Sorry, but no, like does because I know like lots of people are afraid that you know they leave and then someone gets injured and all of a sudden they say, "Geez, that would have been my chance," you know. And like you probably look at a few guys down through the the you know the little period, like say like the likes of a Marty Moore, these guys, you know, Jordy Murphy, Jordy Murphy yeah. is another guy, like Andrew Conway. You could probably say and obviously things have worked out very well for all those guys but is there that kind yeah, of worry yeah. there that you kind of miss out on something that's really you know because Lancer look like kind of head and shoulders above the, the rest just at, at this minute in time you know yeah um, there is that bit of worry but uh, even with the loan deal if there was a couple of injuries I would go back to Lancer until the rest of the season so that kind of covered that, that worry ah, but okay. um yeah, in terms of like the future, obviously, uh, if, if things had changed, like you, you would love to come back or you'd love to, um, you know, have a go um, if the if the opportunity did arise. But um, in terms of the rest of the year, I know if there was injuries, I would be going back. So that kind of made it easier. Uh, and Brian, how did you kind of mentally get your head around the, you know the position you were in in the squad, and that I guess you were very highly thought of by you know players, fans, the coaches. But as Luke said, with all those internationals there, it was difficult to get game time. And while you no doubt felt like you were improving as a player with the coaching you were getting, you, it wasn't really translating into game time. Was that a tough battle mentally just to 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 get your head around? Yeah, um, it was. I think when they come like. <clears throat> At the start of the season, I'd obviously write out goals and uh, like where I want to be kind of mid-season towards the end. And some of the time it didn't obviously go to plan. But um, I think what, what I got good at was if I wasn't playing, I'd make sure that there's a window there that I can get better. Like, or, you know, do extra weight, do extra fitness. Um, so mentally, I kind of dealt with it that way by... Not just kind of moping around, just trying to basically get better and hope, hopefully play the week after. Like so, um, yeah, I, like it obviously is very competitive, and I would have would have loved to play more games, but um, that was kind of kind of the way I went about it. Um, and no, certainly at times it wasn't easy, but um, then like you know you have to just get over. It. No one wants you moping around the squad, so you get over and hopefully play the week after. Was kind of the way I went about it. And would you have had many conversations with Leo Cullen about the selection process or would you kind of just let that take care of itself or would you be knocking on his door asking him, you know, would there be more opportunities or, or why he was thinking a certain way? Yeah, yeah, I would have. I would have went up to him um, when I felt the time was right. Um, yeah, I had some decent conversations with him. Like, so um, I knew where he, the areas he wanted me to get better at and stuff like that. So I always made a kind of made sure that he knew my thought process and where I was coming from. So um, when he can give me work on then we, you know, he can put a plan in place and he can work on them, then he can go back to them again and say, okay, listen, I'm doing this stuff, but what do you think now? Like, so, um, yeah. And what's the goal now for the rest of the season? So obviously Bristol are right in the mix there. Um, you know, obviously one of our, our, our a friend of the pod, Ian Madigan, is obviously playing his part over there as well. Yeah, he, cer- he certainly is. I'm living with him at the minute. He's, oh, are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm in his house as he speaks. So, <laughs> oh, are you? Uh, <laughs> we should get him on that, as well. That, <laughs> <laughs> so how are they enjoying having you in there? A big mucker like you. In, uh, they're, they're newly engaged as well, I see. So Yeah, yeah, they've a, they've a lovely spot here it's, so you're uh, spoiling the romance it, are you <laughs> I'll be moving out soon I'll, I'll moving <laughs> rest out assured <laughs> <laughs> very yeah, good but, um, oh, it's made some difference having him here like yeah. I gave him, a, gave him a ring when I was signing and uh, he's been unbelievably helpful uh, even organising meetings with the coaches when I was coming in and um, just told, told all the lads I was coming and obviously We've been going through the moves and stuff um, a lot, so it's uh, it's made my life a lot easier having them here. 
Yeah, he was my roommate for a while. He used to have to bring me through the moves a few times as well, but <laughs> I, I never left the club, so I didn't really have much of an excuse for not knowing the moves. Um, but so talk to us about the rest of the season, right? So you're in Bristol. There's an opportunity there to get in. Like, where do you see yourself going? I mean, you must be, you know, very ambitious about trying to get as many of those games in as possible and get yourself in that shop window. Yeah, yeah, that's it exactly. Like, um, Bristol are in a cracking spot at the minute. Um, it's four wins in the Premiership in a row, which is is tough to do. Mm. Um, I went, I was an extra for the Bass game on Sunday, uh, which was a serious win. It's the first time in 14 years that they beat them at the wreck. I saw you um, singing after. Were you, were you, do, you know, <laughs> do you know the tune yet? <laughs> no, I, saw, I saw Mads I in the background hopping around, singing away, so he was. But yeah. you obviously weren't singing along yet, no? I was, I was lip syncing. <laughs> <laughs> Go yeah, I need to learn that. <laughs> but uh, no, I am. I am very ambitious for the rest of the season. I hopefully. As I said, hopefully play this weekend and go from there. Um, to, to play like such an exciting brand, um, so it'd be nice to get into that system. And it's very attacking rugby, so um, no, I'm looking forward to it now. Yeah, do you, well, do you think there'll be much of an adjustment? You know, changing leagues because you know the, the the style of play in the Premiership is, as you say, is very attacking, is very fast paced. Do you think there'll be much of an adjustment from that point of view? Um, I think there will be a bit, um, just even like in terms of Bristol learning their attack inside out, like it, it is very detailed um, and it, it'd be a, a lot different to what Leinster would have. Um, but yeah, even at, being at the back game, like they, they just took it up the jumper and they run straight like a lot of the players. So we played the Harlequin Day team last night and uh, they had like a series team out. Gonova was on the wing and that Argentinians from half, um, he was playing, and there's a few, a few heavy hitters. So that was good to get a bit of a taste of it. But um, as, but it, then the Pro 14 and the Europe, like you know, they're obviously all physical games and fast pace. So in terms of that, I don't think we million miles off. But just getting to know the different teams inside out and the style of play, and um, they have will be a small bit different to what we used to. Yeah, one thing we've asked a couple of guys we've had on who've been in the entry setup is, you know, the influence Stuart Lancaster's brought in since he came in. Like, you obviously have probably worked with him, you know, for a number of years now. Is the hype justified? Like, is he as good as all the guys are saying? Yeah, he had, all the hype is justified. I think he's unbelievable. Um, Lance will be lucky to hold on to him for as long as he can. Um, just, yeah, he, he's come in and he's brought, like, an unbelievable attacking system in, really good defensive system and... Uh, he's just so, so detailed and um, he just knows the game so well and he has different ideas each week and he's watching internationals and he's constantly trying to get better himself and trying to get the team better so uh, no he's a class act he right. puts a lot of time into he puts a lot of time into the younger players as well like he properly gives the academy lads a lot of time he's on about building a proper culture and a legacy so um, he's doing a serious job Was Pat Lamb a, a reason for going? Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, we had a good conversation on the phone, and um, he, yeah, really liked the style of rugby he plays. And um, you know, he he has. I've noticed like the culture straight away. Like the, it's different. Like in Leinster, you have the majority of lads are from Leinster, with yeah. a few lads coming in. Whereas in Bristol, there's only a kind of handful of lads from Bristol, and the rest of the lads are coming in from all over the place. So he's done really well to create like. A really good culture, and um, you know, it makes an enjoyable place to be around. With. Yeah, and I mean, I I just think there's there's like with that style of rugby, something that we probably haven't seen enough of you, and well, just probably because you know you, you didn't get the opportunities. But I think that 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 ball in hand would be something that you will really thrive in over there. So I'm really looking forward to seeing if you can thrive in the system um, going forward, you know. And look, in terms of the rest of your game, because I always think this is an interesting thing to ask, uh, you know, someone kind of in your position, um, you know, who's looking to really make a big impact. What, where do you see the growth in your game? Like, what are you looking at at the moment where you're saying, I need to be better at that, um, you know, and that'll make, you know, that'll get me to the top level to, to where I belong? Yeah, well, the things that I'll be working on constantly would be like, obviously, set pieces, your bread and butter, um, so we can't see working on on the throw and on the scrum and, and then around the park, um, probably just kind of bigger shots defensively. Like so, getting myself in a better better position uh, to make bigger hits. Um, that yeah, that'll be it. And then maybe like keeping the ball alive, like getting hands free through contact. 
um, especially with the system they play here. And from a defensive perspective, have you had a chance to chat to John Muldoon at all yet? I know he's been doing uh, defensive work with Bristol. Um, are, you, are you excited to work with him? Yeah, yeah, I am. I had, had a good chat with him uh, over the weekend and um, just learned the system as well. And uh, no, he's, he's even what in the meetings and stuff, he has a very good point of view and uh, it's, it's class to learn from. Mm. And just before we let you go, we really appreciate you kind of giving us a few minutes of your time and, and an insight into your move over. You know, Luke mentioned earlier when you and your brother came in at a young age. Like, what did you make of the Leinster setup back then? You know, with veterans like Luke Fitzgerald. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I wasn't exactly stealing their lunch money, really. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Call them tots. <laughs> I was only they were fresh faced. They were fresh faced. That's what I meant. Uh, oh no, it is unreal. Like. Um, there's some amount of like world class players that've been through there and they're still there. Like so, it was class to learn from them. Um, and uh, yeah, they like obviously Lenser. Um, I absolutely love loved it there for the eight years. Um, it's, uh, yeah, as I said, like even some of the messages I got from some lads were a real touch of class. So it's nearly emotional reading some of them. And uh, yeah, no, there's been a serious group through and. Um, I'll certainly miss playing with a lot, a lot of lads there. And have you been, um, have you been in touch with O'Brien? Have you? I know he was. That, that's. Like you, <laughs> I tell you, yourself and your brother did very well to stay in the straight and narrow with him guiding you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was actually on to him last week. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be back playing soon. But uh, he's on about a trip to Bristol soon. So oh, he's mad as a brush. Keep him away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I locked the doors. <laughs> hey, will he be sleeping with Mads as well? Will he? <laughs> yeah. The fall all their bed, Jesus. <laughs> and Luke, what did you remember the yeah. two lads coming in? Yeah, well, look, I suppose we remember them. They had a brilliant cup campaign with Clongos, and uh, they were part of a brilliant team there. So uh, there was a lot of excitement them coming in. There was a lot of noise about them coming in. Um, and you know, look, I think it's probably it's probably more to do with the setup that we probably haven't seen as much as them as we, as we probably should have. I think in years gone by, the two lads would have been absolute stalwarts. But if you know, Sean Cronin was there. You had Rickard Strauss there, both internationals ahead of the guy. And then obviously Keen Healy and Jack McGrath, you know, at, in the loose head. So a very tough situation to come into for the guys. But I think it's a testament that, you know, Leinster were kind of, uh, you know, hung on to them for for so long and haven't been able to hang on to them for so long. It's because I think they think very highly of the guys. As uh, Brian alluded to, you know, they're you know even when they didn't get selected, they were very positive around the setup. They were great trainers, and that's why I think that. Well, I, look, I I say it to your face, Brian, as well. But on the air, like I, I really think. Um, it's a huge opportunity for you now to really go and showcase those things that you've learned in Leinster and I wouldn't try and change anything about how you've gone about things I'm sure you won't because uh, I don't think you need to do that I think you're in a situation in Leinster where it was kind of extraordinary in, the, in terms of the quality they have and the depth that they have so I think you know you just need to back yourself and, and trust what's, what's got you to where you are because uh, I think you'll really flourish over there and I think if any team as I said on, on online there a couple of weeks ago I think any team would be very lucky to have you in their setup so I'm looking forward to hopefully seen you you know get a run of games and uh, and showcase that so I think it's it's a great bit of business for for Bristol who are very very ambitious and you can see from the quality of the guys that they have coming in next season that they are extremely ambitious you know guys like Radradra and all these guys I hope I pronounce that right decent effort. My, yeah, yeah it was a decent effort yeah. I think I'm happy enough yeah. with that one but I think that you know you can see that they are really really ambitious to go and kick on I think with Saracens you know obviously with the situation there there's a real opportunity for someone to go and grab the grab that kind of league by the scruff of the neck and they've got all the resources to go ahead and do that and do it the right way so big opportunity for you there I'm really looking forward to, to seeing how you get on Bernie I think um, you know go ahead and, and don't leave a, don't leave anything to chance just go for it you know yeah, no, thanks very much, Luke. I appreciate that. You're some man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, look, I, uh, no, seriously, best of luck now. We're, we're really appreciative of you coming on. Uh, tell Mads and Anna we said hello um, and to kick you out as soon as you, they feel like you, you've overstayed the welcome. Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> leave, so leave a bit of grub for her. I'd say Anna's cooking all the grub. I'd say she's like, what's hit her now with this extra big mouth on the, uh, 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 to, to feed at the table? Go on, look, enjoy. Thanks for coming on, man. Really appreciate it, okay? Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thanks many lads. All the best. Cheers, bye bye. Later. That's all we have time for the left wing this week in association with Land Rover. Thank you so much for listening. We will be back next week with another podcast. And in the meantime, you could subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or listen on independent.ie. So until next week, thank you for listening and goodbye. This is a Cork Podcast. 
The Left Wing Podcast in association with Land Rover. Whether you're headed to a match or a weekend away, there's plenty of space for your team and their gear in the new Discovery Sport.